Every week here on Saturday Selection, we like to speak to a familiar face about what they're up to and also ask them the question, what would you do if you ruled the world? Imagine being in charge of the country just for one day <laughs> and having the chance to change whatever you fancied. Well, this week we're delighted to be joined by Chris Wright, who is the co-founder of Chrysalis Music and the Chrysalis Group, the man who gave us Blondie, Spandau Ballet, Jethro Tull, Ultravox, Procol Harum, all of these people. He is the person. <laughs> Chris, what would you do if That's you ruled right. the world? What would you do if you ruled the world, Chris? Well, uh, I thought about this. I mean, I'm not going to rule the world, but if, if I was making any changes in terms of the UK... I would do some things to tidy up Parliament a bit. I would bring in a law that the Prime Minister can only serve two voted in terms. I would, I would try and improve the quality of MPs. I would double their salary. That might be controversial, but I would double their salary. I think uh, the more you pay, the better people you're going to get. But on the other side, I would say no outside jobs whatsoever. And uh, all your investments have got to go into a blind trust for the period of time that you're a, you're a member of Parliament. What do you think about that? Well, uh, we're certainly up for doubling our pay, Chris. You, 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 you're preaching to the converted there, I guess. Um, the, my, uh, my only, uh, the American system of only having two terms, my only concern is that we'd have missed out on a third term of Mrs Thatcher if we'd have, uh, if we'd have gone down. But, but he's only having his rule coming in from now, so we're all right. <laughs> History is fine. I agree well, with you I on know, that. I, I know, I know. I positive there. Yeah, but... But it's not a bad idea overall, you know. You, you know, in, in the real world, people have got limitations on the number of terms, directors, ten years, things like that. So, you know, I don't think you can have a prime minister that serves ad infinitum. And of course, you say that it would have it would have stopped the, the last Tony Blair term as well. Might have stopped the Iraq uh, war. I'm, I'm with you, uh, Chris, because, you know, people frequently say um, you get removed from reality, uh, you don't see the world as it, it is, uh, you, you, you know, and maybe all your greatest ideas you have used up anyway. And I will also say you are exhausted. You'll know what it's like, you know, if you're in a 24-7 media cycle, all of these things that are mm -hmm. happening now. You've had Brexit, yeah. you had COVID, you've now got Ukraine. The individual is absolutely exhausted. So in a way, a, a time limited tenure to me, I think, you know, has to be the way forward. It might only be one term. It might not even be two. Yeah. Well, I, 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 think, I think I really have, having thought about it, I think it's a really, really good idea. And I think, you know, we, we have some problems with our democracy and, and it is something that we should really seriously consider. Now, Chris, we wanted to speak to you. I mean, you are a music legend uh, and, uh, and n not just music. I mean, people probably don't also know the fact that you are the owner of Queen's Park Rangers and Wasps. You brought us Midsummer Murders. Um, yeah. But of all those people that, that Esther was reeling off at the, at the start, um, we, how certain were you that they were going to be successors or did, did any of them particularly surprise you? Well, I think when you start off in the music business, you've got, you know, you've got a lot of real amb ambition. You've got a great deal of confidence in your own ability. And, uh, you know, if you really like uh, a group, you, you really are confident that you're going to be able to make them successful. And uh, yes, I mean, obviously, they're not always successful, but I, would, I must say at Chrysalis, we were, we were, we had a very, very high success rate with the with the artists that we did work with, partly because I think we chose the right artists and partly because I think we were pretty good at, at working with them and and uh, developing their talents on their behalf. So, you know, of course, there's plenty that don't make it, but, you know, that's bound to happen. Chris, what I want to know is um, what was Blondie like? I mean, it was the girl or woman that every girl wanted to be and it was also the girl every bloke probably wanted to date but what was she like well i i've got a lot, lot of time for for debbie harry i think she's she's first of all extremely talented and uh she she wrote most of her own songs or co-wrote almost all of her own songs she has a great voice an iconic look uh she led a very 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 a really great band and you know she she had a few 
problems to deal with. I think when when her partner and the guitarist in the group got ill, we were concerned as to what that might be. But it was quite a serious illness, and that hit them right in their tracks at the height of their fame. Uh, she was kind of like Madonna before Madonna, and you know, she should really have been even a greater icon than than she was. I think I've got an awful lot of time for Debbie. Yeah, so what did you first see in the absolutely gorgeous Debbie Harry? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. well, well the on, music, then. of course, Esther. <laughs> <laughs> what, I, what I want to know, Chris, is there's all those successes. Um, what, were the, what were the acts that got away? What were, the, <laughs> what were the ones that you could have signed and for whatever reason... You didn't, and they went on to be massive, massive successes. Who, who were the hits that got it? And who got blamed for not signing <laughs> yeah, them? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I mean, this always happens, but, you know, if you signed absolutely everybody, you, you know, you'd go bust. You couldn't do that. You're bound to have some that, that, that get away. We, we did work with David Bowie very, very early on. We signed David Bowie up as a songwriter to our music publishing company. And uh, we, could have, we could have signed him to our record company as well. But um, I was out of the country at the time. But, oh, but no. um, it, the other people did decide that he was a great writer, but not necessarily a great performer. So that oh, was clearly goodness. a big mistake. Uh, oh, my goodness. I also, I also remember... You know, the first time I heard Dire Straits, I thought this is really great. And I, I mean, I'm, I've always been a huge fan of great guitarists, and, and Mark Knopfler was, a, was and is a great guitarist. And I was quite upset that we didn't have Dire Straits. I wanted to know why. Um, <laughs> and uh, apparently it was discussed at a meeting, but uh, I couldn't believe that I was at the meeting where we, we, did, where we discussed Dire Straits. In actual fact, I, I dug out the minutes. <laughs> I did a research into it to find out that I actually I was out of the country and not present when they discussed it. One of the members of the team said they were very, very good, but very, very boring. But I think that was a big mistake. <laughs> yeah, their record sales didn't uh, didn't say that. How about, no. how about the Spice we had Girls? The, we, well, we had the Spice Girls around the building. They, I didn't see them. They came in to see the see uh, the guy that was running the music division at the time all four of them they got on his desk and danced and god knows what and apparently we did offer them we offered them i think a quarter of a million pounds to sign to sign to us as songwriters not as recording artists but uh to our publishing company and someone else came in at, with uh 275 and we wouldn't go to 300 and uh i that, I found out that, you know, I said, why didn't we have a crack at the Spice Girls? Well, we did. I was, well, why didn't we sign them? Well, we'd have, you know, they explained this. So I had to go. Well, can you imagine if we come into your office and say, we want to give £300,000 to, the, to, to these, these four or five girls? None of, them, none of them can write and only one of them can sing. You'd have thrown us out <laughs> in our ears. So, so that, but I like the fact, Chris, that you never seem to be around when these bad decisions are being made. Did you not learn a lesson from that? Don't go out the office ever. I'm often around when the good ones are made. And, I, and unfortunately, there's lots of, lots of instances where I wasn't around and good decisions were made as well. Like everything in life, it's a team effort. <laughs> and the Brit Awards, what I was interested mm. in, you had the vision to make sure that they were an annual event. You brought them out of, I don't know, hibernation or whatever you want to say, dusted the idea down and made it an annual event. Well, that's right, Esther, actually. I always used to go to the Grammys in, in L.A. And I felt that it was, it was like it was something we were missing by not having something similar to the, the Grammys in, in England. So uh, I, I basically started what, we, what was called at the time the Brit British Record Industry Awards. And it was, it was after my time that it, I mean, I, we got it going. It started off in uh, one of the big hotels in the West End and then moved to, I think, uh, the Albert Hall or somewhere. That, that was like the last one that I did. But it then became the Brits. It was good to, you know, have, starting it off as the British Record Industry Awards. It's a bit of a mouthful, but you know, it got it, it developed on from from the, those early starts. But I remember some of the shows that that we did in my days. They were fantastic shows. The Dorchester Hotel in the big room there. I think the great room at the Dorchester is is where it started. And I remember Prince being there, and uh, oh, you know, masses of masses of people. It was really great. But it was hosted by. Someone like uh, Tim Rice was involved with it, and 
it was a little bit more for the people in the room but then we got it televised and it, then it moved on to be to be what it's become since Chris, just quickly, I, I, I mentioned that you owned QPR and Wasps. Lord knows why anybody wants to own and, and run a football club. It seems like a, a <laughs> poison chalice to me. I just wondered if you've got any advice for the people queuing up to take over Chelsea Football hey, Club. Hey, we, we could get an exclusive. Or, oh, Chris, will you be going yes, for I, Chelsea? <laughs> well, I can assure you that that's definitely not going to happen. <laughs> I, uh, I, was, I, was reading, I, I was reading about it this morning. There's a, a lot of different groups. I think... From the Chelsea fan standpoint, first of all, I can't see why the government are getting involved in choosing the new owner of Chelsea. I don't think this is something the government wants to take responsibility for because it's likely to go wrong and you wouldn't want to get blamed for it. And really, at the end of the day, for the Chelsea fan standpoint, it's going to be hard to replace Roman Abramovich because he had, a, he had a unlimited funds of money. It's best off for a football club to be owned by one person. I'm seeing talk of consortiums and this guy and that guy that have done this before. And it all sounds great. You know what? Well, he did this and he did that. But it's not going to really work out. You need one guy making the decisions directly with the chief executive and the, the, the manager. That is the best structure to operate a football club. And I can quite see this might not work out too well long term the way it's looking right now. I may be wrong, but hope for the Chelsea fans I'm not. But it will be, it will be a tough transition. And Chris, I completely agree. You can't have the government getting involved in absolutely everything, micromanaging the country on things that they absolutely know nothing about. They'd be better to talk to somebody like you Absolutely. who does have experience in this. But to think that we can get involved is just a nonsense. Yeah, but then why, why are the government getting involved in it? I, I'm, I'm with you. I totally agree. We shouldn't be. Lord knows. <laughs> Lord knows. I mean, I, and, I would just let, I'd let, you know, sort of market, market factors determine it. That's the best way. I mean, how can the government choose a, a, on a beauty parade of people that think I'm the best person to run Chelsea? At the end of the day, it's, it's an impossible task anyway. Chris I mean, making that decision, not running Chelsea, because I mean, <laughs> you know, but it is an impossible task deciding on, a, on a, who's, who's going to be the best person. And if it goes wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Chris Wright, we want to thank you so much for joining us today to telling us what you'd do if you rule the world. It's definitely just two terms in office for a prime minister. Thank you. Oh, you're going to say something. And, uh, and double the salary for you guys. Well. Just think of that. Yeah. You just want to get us off her. That's what it is. Uh, Chris, thank you very much indeed. OK. All right, great. We mentioned great. that he's Thanks. such a top racehorse owner and breeder as well. I mean, and all the stuff he does for charity. We didn't get to any of that.